The Holocaust has symbols, and the central and almost only symbol is the infamous gate of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp. But the murder of Jews began far before, in the summer of 1941, in the then Soviet Union and eastern Poland. We're coming together today, the 29th of September, on the anniversary of the massacre at Babinyar. In just two days, the 29th and 30th of September 1941, Ukraine's Jews were forced to gather, 33,771 of them, and led to the ravine. Men, women, and children all brutally shot to death by the Nazis. It was a site where for years the Germans murdered Jews along with dissenters to Nazi rule. Here's just a glimpse at those two horrifying days 79 years ago in Kiev, Ukraine. Kiev, a prolific center for Jewish education, culture, and political activity. Abundant with important Jewish institutions and more than 230,000 Jewish citizens on the eve of the war. With the complete occupation of the city by the German forces, the Jewish population of Kiev was soon forced to gather in the Babinyar ravines on the outskirts of the city. Headed by foot to Babinyar, the Jewish residents of Kiev were soon forced to undress completely and dispose of the material possessions, naked and afraid, they were beaten inhumanely and led by force into the ravine, forced to lie down on top of the corpses of other Jewish families who had already been shot. In the evening, the Germans buried their corpses under the thick layers of earth. While history buried the story of the once prolific Jewish population of Kiev, this is the untold story of Babinyar where an approximate number of 33,771 Jewish men, women, and children were cruelly and systematically shot dead by Nazi machine guns and handguns on the 29th and 30th of September, 1941, transforming the Babinyar massacre into one of the single largest instances of mass murder carried out during the Holocaust. In the following years of German occupation, Babinyar itself became a mass grave for the brutal extermination of Jews, POWs, Romani, Ukrainians, and others, reaching estimated numbers of around 100,000 lives. Four decades after the war was over, the Soviet authorities had systematically erased the memory of the Babinyar massacre. To mask history, Babinyar was turned by the Soviets into a we site. Today, in the independent state of Ukraine, and with the support of the President, the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center uncovers the facts, details, testimonials, and photo documentations, bringing to light an untold story of inhumanity and cruelness. A story that shall live in the memory of the millions that have died, so it shall never be forgotten, so it shall never be repeated. It was just recently that Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke of the Memorial Center, calling it extremely important to the country and its history, and issuing a reminder that it's upon us to remember and to tell future generations. In this broadcast, marking 79 years since the massacre, we hear a special message from Israeli President Reuven Rivlin. Also joining us, historians, Jewish and non-Jewish leaders from around the world, and the people behind the Memorial Center being raised. לא היה מוות אכזרי, מרוכז ומנוכר יותר, מהמוות בבאבי נייר. עשרות אלפי יהודים, בהם תינוקות, ילדים, נשים וסקנים, נטבחו במשך יומיים בגי ההריגה של בבי נייר. האדמה בפרברי קייב, בירת אוקראינה, השמיעה זעקה אילמת. מעולם, בהיסטוריה של אירופה, לא היה מבצע השמדה גדול כל כך, יעיל כל כך, שבוצע בזמן כה קצר. בבין יר היה לסמל הזוועה. שם החל מסע ההשמדה והרצח השיטתי של יהודי אירופה. בבבין יר לא רק נרצחו עשרות אלפי אנשים, יהודים ולא יהודים, בידי הנאצים ועוזריהם. בבבין יר גם ניסו להשכיח, 
למחוק, להעלים ולטשטש את הפשע, את הראיות ואת העדויות. שני חטאים ידע עמק הנורא ההוא, חטא השמדת האדם וחטא השמדת הזיכרון. יקיריי, חטא ההשמדה כבר נעשה. לא נוכל להשיב את המתים אל החיים. לעולם לא נוכל לדעת אפילו את שמותיהם. מי הם היו? מה היו החלומות שלהם? החלומות שלהם בימי חייהם. ומה חשבו והרגישו בזמן שצעדו אל מותם. אבל אסור לנו, אסור לנו, להיות שותפים לפשע השני. אותו אנחנו חייבים למנוע. אסור לנו לקחת חלק בחטא השכחה, השכחה וההכחשה. רק לפני שבעה חודשים התכנסנו קרוב לחמישים מנהיגי מדינות בירושלים, בירת ישראל, לציון שבעים וחמש שנה לשחרורה של אושוויץ-ברקנאו. זה לצד זה עמדו מנהיגי העולם והביעו את סלידתם ואת מחאתם. מול הקולות שקוראים להכחשת השואה, מול האנטישמיות החדשה שמאיימת להרים את ראשה מול שנאה ואלימות. הכחשת שואה, אנטישמיות, גזענות ושנאת שרים הם שני צדדים של אותו המטבע. עלינו להילחם בהם על ידי חינוך, הסברה וזיכרון. אני מודה לכם, העומדים על משמר הזיכרון, והעושים כל שביכולתם, כדי שאף אחד לעולם לא ישכח. יהי זכרם של אחינו ואחיותינו, שנטבחו בבבי נייר ובאתרי ההשמדה האחרים, חרות על לוח ליבנו לעד. Right here, chair of the board of the Bab Inyar Memorial Center, Natan Sharansky, along with chairman of the Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Center, Avner Shalev. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Natan, you have a very personal connection to this tragedy. So before we talk about the center itself, tell us a little bit about what Bab Inyar actually means for you. Well, uh, I was born in Soviet Union, in Ukraine, in the city Stalino, now Donetsk, uh, in 1948. three years after the World War II. And I grew among the killing fields of Odessa, Kyiv, Kharkov, Dnipropetrovsk, Donetsk. And we played near the places where hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed only a few years ago, and we know, knew nothing about it. And when Babi Yar was mentioned by Russian Soviet poet uh, Yvtushenko, why there are no monuments in Babi Yar? For one day, it seemed that now the, the truth will be told, and then the campaign of slander against any remnant of Holocaust started. So one of the first times that I was arrested when I was activist of Jewish movement was on my way to Babi Yar. So Babi Yar for me was a symbol of Holocaust, of this awful tragedy when millions of Jews were killed and dozens, if not hundreds, of members of our family were killed. And Babi Yar is the symbol of this uh, effort of Soviet Union physically to erase the place, the memory, to turn Babi Yar in stadium, uh, to, in something different. You know, the people will not know what happened to Jews here in this to place. To quite literally erase history. No, to erase history. Well, the Soviet Union was good in believing that history belongs to the leaders, and they were changing their history practically Uh, every few weeks. But here, they simply took the most tragic part of our history and it disappeared. So to grow up within that silence, is that a big part of what made you want to take part in this project and to chair the Memorial Center itself? Oh, no, no doubt that, well, thanks God and thanks to uh, Ukrainian, uh, independent Ukraine, when the Soviet Union fell apart, Ukrainian government changed fully the policy towards uh, the memory of Holocaust. But all the attempts which were to, to make there some significant center of memory and of study failed because of different bureaucratic reasons and the lack of money. That's why when a few years ago the mayor of Kyiv came to me together with some major philanthropists 
from Kiev and from uh, Moscow, who all had relatives killed in Baby Yars of Ukraine, and told me about this project. I understood that here is our chance to close a huge circle in my personal life and the life of our people, <laughs> and to have this uh, uh, project. And I was uh, proud to become the chairman of the international board of, of this project. Avner, there's often a sense, globally for sure, but also in Israel, that the main symbol of the Holocaust is Auschwitz-Birkenau, the gas chambers. I mean, this is what people commonly know about the Holocaust, and that the stories of the over one million Soviet Jews sort of got lost and were silenced. How do you explain that? We can uh, explain it because uh, we didn't forget. It was uh, done uh, uh, in purpose by the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, they didn't want to tell the story of uh, the killing of the Jews in the former Soviet Union. And uh, we had to do something against it. And uh, we did our best, of course. And uh, uh, the best was to tell the story of the shooting and the beginning of the whole shooting process that started uh, after the invasion uh, of uh, the former Soviet Union, Barbarossa, at the time and afterwards. So we knew a bit but the main part of the story was uh, pushed away. And uh, I think the, this is the importance of what we are. On one hand, it symbolizes, as it was said correctly, Nathan had it a personal experience. And we here in Israel also have this kind of an experience, a new experience. And we knew about the shootings, of course. But uh, to tell the full story, the full history of uh, that process, and we couldn't do because it was forbidden at that time by the authorities of the Soviet Union. And this is the point. And from the point that Yevtushenko started to fight against it, it became a double symbol. One of the killing, of the shooting, and the other one for the fight for the truth. The fight of the truth is the most important part of it. And right now we are doing it with, together with the Babiar Center. And I think the importance of it is that all together, the authorities who had all kinds of political ideologies yeah. and, and, and meanings to build a very uh, nice, uh, uh, I will say, narrative, uh, will tell the story. Well, that narrative is clearly being shattered now by the work that you're doing. And you just mentioned the work that the Babinyan Center is doing together with Yad Vashem. So tell us Absolutely. a little bit more about that, because you have an agreement to share archive material, which we all know is so critical to actually uncovering what happened, especially uh, the stories that were silenced in Babin Yard. So how do you think that collaboration is going to change not only the, the missing pieces of what we know, but the commemoration of the Holocaust itself? It's going to change. We are right now in the midst of the process. We, di we didn't start right now because Yad Vashem did all the efforts because we have undertaken the unbelievable mission to collect all the material, all the documentation which exists in the world about the Shoah, about the Holocaust, in Yad Vashem, and we are doing it, and it was specifically important to collect the information about the killing. And uh, right now, we are doing a special project to find the documents and all the facts about each killing site, each of them, more than 2,000, and, and to tell the story of each 2, one of them. 2,000 killing sites. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. And each killing site has the very important news about it who were the people, how was the process done, and what was the, actually the reaction of the neighbors and at that time, mm -hmm. and other Jewish uh, parts who tried their best to uh, fight against it, but, you know, under the circumstances. Well, here a so lot more. Here we are doing a lot by publication, by research, by teaching, and new information, new collaboration will give us another dimension which is very important, and we know that we are going to fight together for the truth. This is the most important and, thing. And already that is bearing fruit. We'll hear yeah. more in this broadcast about some of uh, the information yeah. and the names you know that have come out. I want to make it clear that yeah. Yad Vashem is by far the most important institution on keeping the memory about Holocaust. It's an absolutely unique institution. There is nothing like this uh, in the world. but. It is in the very best interest of us who start this initiative in Babi Yar. So Avner Shalev and Nathan Sharansky, thanks so much for being Thank here. Thank you.
Thank you. You're mostly welcome. Yes. It's very important yeah. collaboration. Thank you. Former U.S. Senator Joe Lieberman is a member of the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center Super Advisory Board. The atrocities against the Jewish people and the millions of others killed during the Holocaust can never be forgotten. Everybody agrees with that. But then the question is, what will we do about it? And yet what you have done today is to take action to make sure that the brutal murders, genocide of the Holocaust is not forgotten. I'm proud that you've given me this opportunity to play a small part as a member of the board of this center in ensuring that the memories of the 33,771 lives that were taken during the Nazis' brutal massacre at Babi Yar in September of 1941 will be rightfully and respectfully honored and remembered. Even today, as we solemnly acknowledge the 75th anniversary of the Nazis' barbaric acts at Babi Yar, we are faced with a world where intolerance, bigotry, hatred, and even genocide still rear their horrific heads. It is up to each one of us to fight against such evil, to take concrete action, to recognize the horrors of the past and the present, and to understand as Elie Wiesel said so profoundly, uh, neutrality is not an acceptable position. Silence is not an acceptable position in the face of genocide. Um, forgetfulness is not an acceptable position. Um, we, we need memory, and we need to honor those dead by our memory and by what we do based on that memory. Uh, with the Babi Yar Holocaust Memorial Center. You will first pay tribute to the thousands of lives taken here uh, and throughout the Holocaust, but you will also teach our children and grandchildren about the truth of the Holocaust in the former Soviet Union. And in that way, you'll help ensure that history dare not repeat itself. I end with a, with a prayer that the memories of those who were lost at Babi Yar and throughout the Holocaust be a blessing for each of you and your families and that they be an inspiration to us not just to never forget but to act affirmatively as you have to make sure that we remember uh, and we take action uh, to bring uh, tolerance, acceptance, peace, and justice uh, to the world. Thank you very much, and God bless each and every one of you and this center. Все ревереи должны собраться в одном месте. Не думали, что на расстрел. Думали, что в Палестину будут отправлять. Мама пошла с бабушкой. И меня взяла с собой. Потому что я думал, что я ничего не пережил особо. С кастетами, с цепями, со всеми избивали, как только могли, и палками, и вот народ, проходящий туда. Они раздевали уже их полностью до гола, снимали все. Могли расстрелять, но Бог сохранил меня. Max Yakover is CEO of the Babinyar Memorial Center. He joins us now from Kiev. Max, before we talk, let's take a moment to hear more about the Memorial Center itself and the team behind it. Babinyar Foundation. Since 2016, we are working on regenerating the memory of more than 100,000 victims. 
slaughtered in Babanyar Ravine during the Holocaust. We believe that their stories are worth sharing and will remain actual for many decades. Our goal is to commemorate real people by revealing their stories and to do so we are developing the concept of an interactive Holocaust museum. Who are we? The team of scientists, artists, architects, researchers and creatives united to cultivate the memory of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. Supervised by a board of human rights activists, artists, entrepreneurs, religious and political leaders from all over the world. Because Mute Monument won't make a difference. Commemoration requires interaction. To tell new stories we need to take a look from different perspectives. Our projects engage the new generations to synthesise information differently through visual narratives, 3D maps, collaborative networks, educational projects, audio exhibitions and an interactive library. Those and many other projects will form the foundation of the future Babinyar Memorial Museum. But before that, they'll become available to the international community through an online museum, launching in August 2020. So Max, talk to us about this long overdue memorial center. What exactly is it set to include? The Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center is being built in order to tell the story of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. We built this world-class unique museum that is placed at the exact place where the tragedy of Babin Yar happened. The museum is preserving stories of the past so we can draw lessons for the future and make sure those atrocities would never happen again. Babin Yar Museum, with its innovative technology and creative approaches, uh, will create a long-lasting impact and respectfully educate audience about these dark periods, while keeping the memory of those who were lost alive. It's a filling part of the puzzle that was missing in the story of the Holocaust. And looking ahead, what are some of the milestones we can expect in opening the museum? We are due to open uh, in 2025-2026, uh, but uh, we have many parts of the museum uh, already in progress uh, or working. Uh, we have the full historic narrative written and approved. We have uh, more than 12 programs uh, we already open for the public. We will have the full artistic concept of the museum presented by the end of the year. It is important to meet the audience as fast as we can. So will the center focus only on the history of Eastern European Jewry or also on the other minorities killed in that region during World War II? As I said before, this museum will make a contribution to world knowledge about this period. So it's for humanity as a whole. Uh, such a uh, museum is about people for the people. Eh? We cherish the memory of all who died. Jews, Ukrainians, Russians, sons and daughters of Roma, those who were mentally ill or, or disabled. All people. All right, Max Yakover, CEO of the Babinyar Memorial Center, thanks so much for being with us. The artistic director of the Babinyar Memorial Center is Ilya Kharjanovsky. He's now working on developing the artistic concept of the museum and how to deal with the fact that soon there will be no more Holocaust survivors to tell their own stories. And at the core of all of it is technology to help bridge that gap and attract younger generations. It is quite a responsibility to deal with such an important project of the memory of the Holocaust and really the Jewish people. Tell me a bit about what this experience has been like for you personally. For me, it's a very personal story because my mother was born in Ukraine in 1940 and she was born in Vinitsa. And a few days after the war, is, uh, after the beginning of the war, my grandfather, her father, put her in a train, her and her brother, my uncle and my, my grandmother, and they left Vinitsa. And probably all of us knew that in Vinitsa, almost no Jews had survived. And I know the story of Holocaust through the memories of my family, to friends of my family. Uh, and for me, it's a very personal story. And it's given me a lot of responsibility to make it um, uh, emotional, strong, but with a lot of sensitivity and respect. So Ilya, the museum is going to open its doors a few years down the line, but it's already really active right now. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing in terms of research and education. In all um, generation, in all times, 1,000 years ago, 200 years ago, 50 years ago, for each generation, 
uh, each generation and each time have own language. Now we're coming in a time where we have VR technologies, where we have uh, artificial intelligence, where we have 3D modeling and other um, technological tools. What actually give uh, to the new generation just possibility to touch, to feel things in a language through, through the way how they can um, really understand it. One of the examples from other projects, what we have, is 3D modeling. Uh, we find a um, great group of people, very talented Ukrainian uh, architects and scientists, who did a project uh, which actually gave us possibility first time after almost uh, 79 years to understand where precise the strategic event happened. You mentioned 3D modeling. Let's take a closer look at what exactly the museum is doing with that technology as we speak. Babinyar Models combines digital media and historic research to form a growing knowledge base of one of the most important locations in the history of the Holocaust. Using the archival materials, topographic maps, photographs and videos, historic reports and witnesses' testimonies, our research team has reconstructed the Babinyar landscape in 3D space. The virtual models show how a massive, naturally formed ravine changed over time. Here is how Babinyar terrain looked like in 1924. But in the pictures taken in less than 20 years, it looks very different. To reconstruct the changes in the terrain, we match dozens of photographs taken from air camera positions and from the ground. We search for the distinct elements of the landscape to pinpoint the exact locations of camera positions and reconstructed the scenes using virtual cameras. Then, using the shadow analysis, we verified the camera position and the time when the picture was taken. The interactive atlas of Babinyar is open to the international public. You can explore interactive 3D scenes, revisit the sites of the historic events, take time to look around and fully immerse into the stories of Babinyar. And joining the conversation now is Anna Foreman, Director of Archival Research and the Names Project at the Babinyar Memorial Center. Anna, it's great to have you with us. So, I mean, you've been working on this, I understand, for the last nine months. Tell us a little bit about what you've discovered and what was your approach in doing it in the first place? Uh, the main achievement uh, in our work is uh, that we find more than 900 names of uh, Babinyar victims. These names uh, were never mentioned in any list uh, before. It's our significant discovery and uh, achievement that we, we continue to search for more names uh, which must be remembered. And uh, of course, uh, this is a result of uh, our work uh, in Ukrainian and in foreign archives. We are continuously working with archival documents uh, which were never explored before in archives which were closed to the general public. And uh, we also are working in uh, digitization of these documents uh, and uh, we'll make uh, them uh, accessible for everyone who need to, to more know about uh, their relatives. Those are the names of the people that ended up being executed in the Babinyar. And you can see those empty spots, like here and here, everywhere actually. Our research team performs the massive digitalization of the previously unexamined data, forming the complete picture of the Kiev population during the 1941 to 1943 occupation. Processing file cabinets, registry office archives, personal collections, memoirs, evidence of allegations, interrogation records, we create the missing links that form a new database of the Babinyar tragedy. Comparative analysis and complex approach helped us to restore unknown facts on 834 victims within just a couple of months. The ongoing research constantly recovers new connections, revealing the enormous impact of the Babinyar tragedy on the city nowadays. So we are constantly working to make all lost names to be found. Because every life matters, and no one deserves to be forgotten.
Ilya, a really key question that you touched on a little bit is what Holocaust education could actually look like in the future for generations who will never meet a survivor. So what more are you doing to bridge that gap? First of all, we're telling the story of tragic, difficult, um, and complex period of time. Uh, in this time, humanity, human beings, was tested and actually failed. And, um, and this story is about Jewish people, of course, but it's about people in general. That's why the importance of the project, uh, I think, <clears throat> and, and possibility to, to create um, the museum which can touch people um, who is not Jewish at all, who not connected to the story of Holocaust, but through this story to teach him and to share with them this pain and this danger, uh, for that, uh, we need to uh, find a way in the language. The fact that Holocaust survivors, uh, it's probably last decade where they're still with us, most of them will, will leave us soon. The fact that they've been here, that uh, they uh, give us unique uh, evidence uh, of things, what's happened and how it's happened, uh, through the contemporary technology, it's possible to keep them in a way um, emotionally alive. Because what keep people, human beings, human beings? Remembrance is the biggest part of culture. Without that, we're not humans. And we are not humans without compassion, images, uh, sound, spaces, atmosphere can give you feeling that you in a contact with the people who already gone. That's why we believe that this project, uh, this museum, it's can it's probably will be first museum, first big Holocaust memorial center, which will be built on a time, this transition time, where the, the actual witnesses will go and our responsibility, and it's a huge responsibility, to make this transition in a way that we don't lose anything, to give to young generation, to generation who will come later, to new generation, possibility to feel this past like a present, to understand that the story is not about past, and it's not about uh, some Germans who killed some Jews. It's about us. It's about every human being who lives in this earth. Ilya Kharjanovsky, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Olena Sotnik is Director of Foreign Affairs at the Babinyar Memorial Center. She joins us now from Kiev. Olena, it's great to have you with us. So you joined the center after a career in diplomacy and in politics representing Ukraine to the West. So what made you want to take part in this initiative? First of all, it is about people, about team, about main figures who are telling the story. Natan Sharansky, who is the world famous uh, right, human rights defenders and of course very important political figure. Uh, also Mr. Rukas, Mr. Grunevich, who is the famous historian in Holocaust, uh, who are helping us with narrative and with historical point. So working with them I think it is very honorable. The second one of course story not history, but story, how we are going to tell the story to our people, to new generations. So I think it is very important to talk the, about uh, Holocaust, to talk about Babin Yar, in the way that we can build bright future for human beings, bright future for Ukraine, and bright future for the world. Because in the very core of the story is humanity. Olena, there seems to be a shift in the bigger picture as well. In the past year, the EU has established a working group with members of EU Parliament on this issue in particular. So with all your experience, especially in government diplomacy, how do you see the importance of this group? Of course, uh, when we are talking about Babin Yar, we are not talking just about uh, project in Ukraine or in Kyiv. 
I believe this is a very important topic for Europe. This is a very important to topic for the whole world uh, because it is about the most tra tra tragic moments of our history. So when we can have uh, working group parliamentarians in the European Parliament, it means that Holocaust Memorial in Ukraine, in the capital of Ukraine, in Kyiv, it is important topic for the European Union. It is important to topic for politicians. And it, of course, it is important topic for uh, citizens of Europe. And when you have this political support, and international support. It helps you to bring this story to Ukrainian agenda. It helps us to talk about it because for 80 years, especially during Soviet Union, it was silence about Babin Yar. We didn't know anything. I was born in Kyiv and uh, I didn't know the whole story. And I think this is a moment when uh, international politicians, when international institutions, they are helping Ukraine to tell the story, to tell the story with very important uh, narrative, to tell the story for the future generations. Olena, I, I mean, what you're saying, it's pretty incredible to think that someone like you, that so many people who grew up in Kiev with this site in their backyard might not have known the whole story. And the Babinyar Memorial Center, we know, is already making such strides in ending that silence. So, so obviously, obviously such, such important, important work that... that you're, you're doing. doing. Olena Sotnik, thanks, thanks so much for being, being with us there from Kiev. And let's bring in a prominent Jewish voice. Malcolm Honline is the executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. Joining us now from New York, Malcolm, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So in your work, you've obviously visited dozens of capitals around the world, and many of them have their own Holocaust museums. And here in this broadcast, we've been talking about this new memorial center in Kiev to tell the lesser known stories of tens of thousands of Ukrainian Jews shot to death near their homes and over a million more who suffered really the same fate across Eastern Europe. So how do you see the establishment of this center in the sort of bigger picture of commemorating the Holocaust? I think it is very important. I visited Babi Yar and several times over the years and I saw the attempts to deny to disclaim, to uh, obfuscate the reality of what happened there. And we know that after the war, they try to hide the results by burning the bodies and th th doing away with any evidence of incrimination. We know that what occurred in Babi Yar was unique. It was shooting. It was bullets. It wasn't gas chambers. It was participation of people. And there is no deniability that they didn't know what occurred there. But over time, there were efforts to erase that history. By establishing a museum there, we remind people of the importance of what occurred. For us, history is not about the past, it's about the future. By memorializing what occurred at Babi Yar, we are working to prevent its reoccurrence in future years. Well, Malcolm, well, Malcolm you, mentioned you mentioned silence. silence. And, and, and in Ukraine, Ukraine under, under Soviet, Soviet rule, as we've been talking about, about, there was a deliberate, deliberate policy, policy of silencing, of silencing those, those stories, burying, burying the memory. And now, now independent, independent Ukraine, Ukraine and President, and President Zelensky, Zelensky are ready, are ready to, to confront, confront, they are confronting, they are confronting what, happened what happened in that, in that territory. territory. So, so what do you what think, do you think that, that means if we look, if we look at Ukraine's, Ukraine's ties with the, with West. the West? I think that this is an important step on the part of Ukraine and all countries to come to the truth of their past, to confront it, not to avoid it, not to deny it, not to try to change it, but to admit to it and to learn the lessons from it. And, and I, I think, think the Ukraine, Ukraine, under the current president, has taken important steps in that regard. And Ukraine's standing in the West will be enhanced by this, by the fact that they are willing to be a leader. This kind of memorial and this kind of confrontation with the past is especially important. Malcolm Honline in New York, pleasure to have you with us as always. Thank you. And joining the conversation also from New York, David Harris, executive director of the American Jewish Committee. Thank David, you. thanks so Thank much you. for being with us. So, I mean, you are a Jewish leader who has fought for decades for the Jewish people. And the Holocaust, I know, is a fundamental event that affected your personal life and professional career. So could you tell me a little bit about what Babin Yar sort of means to you personally? Yes, um, I'm the first member of my family born in the United States. Every member of my family, including my parents, uh, were all um, victims of, of the Nazis of the Second World War. 
So the Holocaust was very much embedded in my consciousness from a very early age. On top of that, my mother was born in Moscow and I come from a Russian speaking family. So in fact, my, my first recollection of Babi Yar was just shy of my 12th birthday uh, in August 1961, when a Soviet poet, Yevgeny Yevtushenko, uh, emerged on the global stage with his famous poem, Babi Yar. And the very first words of that poem, Nad Babi Yarm Pamnikov uh, Nyet. In Babi Yar, there are no monuments. Uh, I was, again, a young person, but I understood instinctively the importance of what he was saying, especially coming from the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, it was published in Literaturnia Gazeta, which was one of the most prominent newspapers in Russia. It was quite unusual. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, Dmitry Shostakovich, the famous Soviet composer, called uh, Yevtushenko and said he wanted to write a symphony. And he wrote his 13th symphony inspired by Babi Yar. So even though I was young and pronouncing names like Yevtushenko and Shostakovich and Literaturnia Gazeta were uh, difficult for me, Nonetheless, I already began to understand that something terrible had happened in Babi Yar. And of course, later learned that 33,771 Jews were killed in just two nights by the Einsatzgruppen in what was the most dubious record in human history of mass murder. And of course, many more were to follow. Uh, in 1981, 20 years later, and on the 40th anniversary, I had my first visit to Babi Yar. And I had my first glimpse, not just of the ravine, but of the Soviet monument. And the Soviet monument, um, written in Russian, uh, I will translate, was to the victims of fascism. The word Yivrei, Jew, did not appear anywhere on the Soviet monument. Uh, the specific tragedy of the Jews during the Holocaust was not referenced, neither on that monument nor by the Soviet authorities elsewhere. And then I began to understand the instrumentalization of history. Um, by the Soviets in this case. So what happened after 1991 was frankly a bit, a bit refreshing, if still complicated. I wanna go back in history for a moment also because you yourself had a role in history. I mean, you were an activist working to free Soviet Jews from the former USSR. You were a witness to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So how do you see Ukraine's efforts now to turn towards the West? I mean, is this look into the dark pages of history, confronting history, a step towards adopting Western values? It's an essential step. Uh, the American Jewish Committee and I personally had the privilege of appealing to President George H.W. Bush in 1991, urging the United States to recognize the rebirth of Ukrainian independence. Uh, President Bush was hesitant. He didn't want to undermine President Gorbachev's um, diminishing authority. So we have been supportive of Ukraine's effort, number one, to reestablish its independence, uh, and its territorial integrity, and number two, to to deal with both uh, the, the past and the contemporary issues of Jewish life in Ukraine, uh, the memory of Jewish life, uh, and uh, Ukraine's relationship with Israel. So the last, um, in this case, uh, 29 years, uh, we've been active. I've been to Kiev more times than I can count. Uh, we've hosted Ukrainian leaders, uh, and our point is, has always been the same. Uh, Confronting history, honestly, is an important part of any nation's self-awareness. Ukraine is not responsible for the crimes of the Soviet Union. To properly honoring the memory of what are now uh, well over 100,000 documented murders uh, in Babi Yar, including those on September 29th and 30th, 1991, Ukraine, of course, is going in the right direction. We supported the Maidan revolution. We established a temporary office, that is the American Jewish Committee in Kiev to support the Maidan revolution. So we have been friends of Ukraine and we have said consistently that as friends of Ukraine, um, confront the past, um, memorialize the past, uh, address contemporary issues of anti-Semitism. And because you, Ukraine, understand better than most how far anti-Semitism can descend, both because of the Nazi occupation and because of the Soviet ideology after the war, you should become a global leader. You should become a loud voice around the world in reminding uh, all of us what the slippery slope of anti-Semitism can look like and where left unchecked it can lead. And what a change that would be from the silencing 
that once was so many decades ago. David Harris, president of the American Jewish Committee, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And now Dr. Joseph Schuster, head of the Jewish community in Germany, wanted to share a few words from Berlin. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the Shoah is burned deep into our Jewish soul. For us, upholding the memory of those who were murdered is a sacred duty. We can't forget what was done to our families, to our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Almost every European Jew bears these scars. Our parents were lucky, they escaped. If they haven't, we wouldn't be here, but others were less lucky. And yet, for many people today, remembering the Holocaust is difficult. For us Jews, it is merely 75 years ago that the camps were liberated. But for many non-Jews, it's already 75 years away. In other words, ancient history, nothing to get excited about. Let me frank. This is a dangerous development and we should not be afraid to say so. In Germany, we have seen a stark rise in anti-Semitism and in far-right extremism, including the belittling of the German Nazi pest. Of course, young people are not responsible for what happened three generations ago. But they are responsible, we are all responsible, that it will not happen again, never again, not against Jews, not against any other minority. On September 26, 1941, after the German Wehrmacht had just conquered Kiev, army and SS decided to kill all Jewish inhabitants of the city, straight away. They called it Vergeltung, Revanche. I ask you, revenge for what? What had these poor souls done to merit such a treatment? No, it was cold-blooded mass murder. Jews were murdered only because they were Jews. It was murder on a scale and at a speed that nobody in Europe had witnessed before. Only four days later, the Nazis put their plan into action. 33,771 Jews, 33,771 Jews were rounded up, brought to the ravine at Babi Yar, forced to undress and shot dead. Though out the night, firing squad shot at women, men and children. There was no mercy. Babi Yar was one of the biggest single massacres of civilians in World War II. We must remember it. The world must never, never forget it. The world must continue to look into the abyss of Babia, into the abyss of Auschwitz, and into the abyss of the thousands of killing sites all over Europe. Because it be, if we forget what happened, it, if we forget where hate speech and incitement against ethnic or religious minorities can lead, it will and can happen again. The great Elie Wiesel said 20 years ago in the German parliament, and I quote, those who want to turn the page have done so already. Let me add, too many have turned the page. Too many look the other way when hate and anti-Semitism anti are rising again. Too many. But that is why memorials like the one at Babia are so important. They will remain for future generations. They will be a witness of the evil committed against the Jewish people. Once the last survivors of the Holocaust are no longer with us, we need other forms to remember. We need to reach out to the younger generation. We need to tell them what happened, but without pointing fingers at them. On behalf of the Jewish community in Germany, let me thank you all for the work you have undertaken. You are making sure that Babi Yar will not be forgotten. Thank you. Jewish leaders from around the world wanted to be part of this conversation and to say a few words in memory of those who perished in Babi Yar. Joining us now is the head of the Jewish Agency for Israel, Isaac Herzog. Pleasure to have you here. Pleasure to be here with you. So let's start on the personal side, because these stories are so deeply personal for so many. 
What is Babinyar for you? What does it mean for you? Look, Babinyar, I, I don't have family members who perished in Babinyar. My late father, Chaim Herzog, who was later Israel's sixth president, was one of the first officers of the British Army to enter Bergen-Belsen. And on the way, he saw pits filled with bodies. And when he walked into the uh, camp, he saw, you know, skeletons with pajamas. And he told them, I'm a Jewish officer from Eretz Israel in Yiddish. And they thought he's a Nazi uh, perpetrator. And they ran away. It took time for them to understand that they are liberated. Babi Yar is a unique, unique event in history. Because what we know, we know, of course, of the organized uh, demolition of Jews, extermination of Jews sure. in the camps. But we don't know enough about the action of killing and bur burying people in pits. The numbers are horrendous. It's almost inexplicable. And let me tell you a personal story. When I was a member of the Knesset for many years, there's a, there's a beautiful oil painting of the Babiar massacre right near the prime minister's office in the Knesset, given by a Holocaust survivor from Umeid Aliyah from the former Soviet Union. And that picture is so powerful because you see parents and grandparents carrying their baby into the pit. This is shocking. And I used to take leaders from all over the world and to explain them to them about Babi Yar. And I wish that now every human being will know about Babi Yar because the um, cruelty is, all, is in, in, in comprehensible. That's the issue with Babi Yar. Yeah. And the silence around it, certainly, which is something you just mentioned. I and mean, then there's the silence of those who never took action. Thousands of people were part of this massacre, of this human, hyenas crime. Well, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, the Jewish Agency brought over a million Soviet Jews to Israel, and among them, of course, uh, Holocaust survivors and their families. And there was this prevailing feeling that their stories, of, of the stories of Eastern Europe, were forgotten. Do you think that was the case? I mean, why do you think that well, was the I case? Well, I think there was a priority in time given to other stories, because first of all, you said the Iron Curtain. The Soviet regime did not want to expose Babi Yar enough. It exposed, of course, the heroic story of the Great War and the Red Army's heroism, which truly saved humanity and civilization. But nonetheless, the, this story, like Babi Yar and others, was, was not told enough. And he, people in Israel had no, not much of a clue. There were some poems. People spoke about it, but it did not become the main issue. The main issues were, of course, the concentration camps. Right. And uh, it takes time. There are many other stories in Eastern Europe which are, remained untold. Punau was untold for a long sure. time. There are, look, and, and of course, the issue of fleeing Jews who fled to Siberia from other countries like uh, Latvia and Lit Lithuania and, and so forth. These are stories that must be told in this generation. And Babi Yar rises above all because it is a story of 70,000 human beings who were, who were killed in mass killings, in graveyards, families and all by human beings who were supposed to be human beings. Right. And killed close to home at that. Killed I mean, close to home. These days, obviously, this memorial center is doing exactly that. It's about bringing that memory, ending that silence, learning the names of those who died there. Um, and I, I mean, when we look at it in the context of today's reality, it's hard to separate it. Global anti-Semitism, I mean, rising across the board. How do you see the role of this museum, of this of First this of all, I want to commend those who uh, are founding and supporting and financing and leading this museum. I think it's vital. And I think they're all incredible uh, people with vision because they realize that this story, if not told now, will never be told. And you want to hear those who are still with us who remember and recall. And this will also help to explain the price, the horrific price of hate and anti-Semitism. One has to stand up and explain to human beings where it brings humanity to hating Jews, how Jewish hate brought the world to its lowest ever point ever. 
Well, a reminder, an important reminder from you that the clock is ticking on remembering those stories, on telling them, and setting it up to remember it in future generations who won't get to meet a Holocaust survivor. Isaac Herzog, thanks so much for being thank here. Thank you, and thanks for this initiative. Every year, for over 30 years now, the March of the Living has brought more than 10,000 young people, Jewish and non-Jewish, on a powerful historical journey to the site of the extermination camps in Poland. It culminates in a march from the Auschwitz to the Birkenau death camps. And joining the conversation now is chairman of the International March of the Living, Dr. Shmuel Rosenman. Dr. Rosenman, great to have you here with us. Thank you very much. So, I mean, as we've heard here throughout, Auschwitz has long been sort of the symbol, the global symbol of the genocide. And sometimes forgotten are the over one million Jews murdered, not just in Poland, but across Eastern Europe. I mean, are, are there stories told in your work in the process of the March of the Living? Yeah, for sure, for sure. You see, the, the major target of March of the Living is really to carry the torch of memory from one generation to others, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have so many in the beginning survivors who could tell the story. So some people came from Poland, some people came from Ukraine, some from Romania, some other places. So everyone is being heard. A part of our preparation to the big journey to Poland, to Auschwitz, you have about 10 to 15 different meetings and we are trying to cover most of the stories of the Holocaust. So many stories. Do you, do you see room in the March of the Living, in, in this work that you do, to integrate places that are maybe lesser known by most, like Babinyar and Ponar, for example? For sure. So much of the living from the beginning, from the beginning, decided to go to other places. You know, from different logistic reasons, we did not do it so many years. But in the last couple of years, we are participating in Greece, we are participating in Vilna, we are participating in uh, uh, different other places, okay? And I think Babi Yar, it's a major story. It's not just a major a story of Ukraine. It's a story of East European Jewry. We are talking about 1.4 million Jews, which killed not in the camps, okay? And it's a major story that we are telling the students. They are seeing movies. And I believe it's something must be done also in this place. Well, you just pointed to the difficulty now with so much Holocaust denial or just ignorance, people who simply don't know about it, and especially looking towards the future as there become fewer and fewer survivors who can tell their story, who can join this March of the Living. What are some of the challenges that you've run into in Holocaust education? I think the major challenges is really the diminishing of the survivors. So we believe that one best way to do it is to try to build what is called by digital um, parts, okay, um, holograms and other, you know, technical things to tell the story. We are working today, today quite close with the Shoah Foundation of Los, Los Angeles. It's a big museum in Poland, in Warsaw, which also this part, I think we are missing some other places like in Babia and other places to bring people to tell the story. The ignorance and the diminishing of the survivors, it's an excellent formula to forget what happened. So you're really actively looking towards solutions for how to, to fill their shoes, so to speak. As, as many as possible. All right, Dr. Shmuel Rosenman, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thousands of Ukrainians put their own lives at risk to save Jews from perishing at the hands of the Nazi regime. 2,634 of them are noted in Yad Vashem as the righteous among the nations. Over the last year, the Babinyar Memorial Center has found hundreds of those Ukrainian citizens documenting their stories and even supporting them with food deliveries and visits to help ward off loneliness. Let's take a look at one story out of thousands. Here, a daughter of one of those righteous among the nations, Olga Kobetz. Очень большая. Ама ушла на фронт. 
Лева ушел на фронт, Додя ушел на фронт, остался один Боря глухонемой, старший был, и Илюша маленький. И когда уже в конце сентября вывесили объявление, что ты всех евреев явитесь на в указанное место, они не пошли. Они, они не пошли. Потому что э, еще, может быть, думали, может быть, может быть, может быть, что-то. А потом были облавы. И они с Борей пошли, с этим старшим. Ну, надо там было пшена купить, что чем-то пита облава. И они попали в Бабе Яр. А Илюша, Илюша остался, Илюша остался, остался у нас бабушка его и, и мама, и никому ничего, он, он два года мы жили вместе. Ну, Илюшка, когда не доведи Бог, что он уходил вот сюда, их настояла кровать вот тут вот, его он ложился, бабушка укрывала лейбиками, дитя больное, хлопец больный, хлопец, ой, ой, температура, ой, не, не, тип. А мы не знаем. Они боялись очень тиф. Я, я не знаю, бо врача нема. У нас там э, погреб был в доме большой. И потом у бабушки, вот там, э, он же был высокий, этот дом. И, и там железо всякое, ну, всякие такие. Это, так мы туда залазили. А если бы вас сдали? Если бы сдали вас? Мы бы расстреляли нас. Всех, всю семью. Всю семью, всю. если бы... За то, что ты прячешь евреев, тогда же всех стреляли. Бабушка давала сведения, что евреи у нас в доме не проживают. Коммунисты у нас в доме не проживают. А вот этот полицай приходил, и бабушка к нему падала в наколени и просила, Ваня, что ж ты? А, ты же денка прячешь. Наверное, все-таки сердце дрогнуло, что это ребенок. Но бабушку он все время терроризировал. Ты, говорит, жиденка прячешь. Когда бывало немцы, так мы прятались. Вот я показывала там и, и, под, и, и погреб у нас, и, и была пристройка, там всякие мусоры. Мы туда, бывало, залазили. Ну, вот так вот прожили. Встретили наших в сорок третьем году. Babinyar. No monument stands over Babinyar. A steep cliff only, like the rudest headstone. I am afraid. Today, I am as old as the entire Jewish race itself. Those words, part of a poem written by the poet Evgeny Yevtushenko, born to a Ukrainian mother and a German father, a protest of the Soviet Union's code of silence on the massacre of all its Jews, and Ukrainian Jews in particular, during the Second World War. It was written and published following Yevtushenko's visit to the site of the murder of Kiev's Jews, Babinyar, where, in his words, no monument stands. That is now changing. Thanks so much for being with us to mark 79 years since the massacre at Babinyar and to remember the story of over one million Jews who lost their lives in Eastern Europe at the hands of Nazi Germany. We'll leave you with the traditional Jewish prayer for mercy for the souls of the departed, reciting it. Ukraine's chief rabbi Dov Joseph Bleich in Babinyar. <laughs> Kizara kamirim u mazirim Es nishma isahil machyseino Avois vihima is tinoikas yanki shadaim Shanel govishanish kato Shanis rubovshanik bruchaim Shanis plaki dusha shem babi al Ayade yamarats kama germanim anatsim o israyem Thank you.
וגן עדן, די מנוחסם, ויעמדו לו גרלום לקיץ הימין, ונאמר אמן.